Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. That is a quote by Marianne Williamson. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Welcome to episode 172. I am delighted to announce that I'll be speaking at Women in Tech, Texas on 19th through the 20th of May, 2022. This event offers an immersive educational experience for like-minded women to access proven strategies and tools to support them in their mission to achieve their career goals. Registration is now open. Book your pass today and secure a 15% discount with my special discount code. And that code is W-I-T-T-S-P-E-A-K-E-R-15. And the website is www dot women hyphen in hyphen tech hyphen texas dot com. The topic of this week's episode is ladies leading. My guest this week is Dr. Ava Thompson Greenwell. Dr. Greenwell is the author of Ladies Leading, the Black Women Who Control Television News, filmmaker of Mandela in Chicago, podcaster, and journalism professor. She is a Chicago native and the director and producer of Mandela in Chicago, a documentary film about the city's anti-apartheid movement. She is also the author of Ladies Leading, the Black Women Who Control Television News. Dr. Greenwell is an academic life coach, has been a freelance correspondent for WGN-TV and Chicago Tonight, a PBS news program. She also worked as a reporter at WFLA-TV in Tampa, WCCO-TV in Minneapolis, and WEHT-TV in Evansville, Indiana. Hi, Ava. Welcome to Trina Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, Trina. You know, I am... They're very excited to speak with you. And and I know I say that to all my guests, but you being a fellow Chicagoan as am I is very exciting to me and just the things that you're doing and how you're showing up in the space. So how I always start out the show, I ask my guests to tell the listeners who you are and how you became the Ava that you are today. So my name is, again, Ava Thompson Greenwell. And I always include that maiden name because um, I come from a very small family. There was just myself. And then I had a brother who we were about 12 years apart and he passed away when he was only 31. And so because of that, uh, there aren't that many Thompsons left. And so it's important for me to keep that name in the family. And so that's why I use that um, maiden name as a middle name. So how I got to where I am today, I would say growing up on the south side of Chicago, living in um, a single parent household, but also living with my grandmother and my mother, it gave me a sense of, of what it was like to, you know, have to struggle from time to time, but at the same time, just, um, not wallowing in that struggle. And I think that really gave me a positive attitude and a positive outlook. Both my mother and grandmother really emphasized education and that it was important to get your education. I remember my grandmother used to say that. And so as a result of that, you know, I tried to do the best I could in school. And that was both elementary school, high school. I ended up going to uh, Northwestern for journalism, Uh, really started 
being interested in journalism as part of a career development project at Chicago State University. And they said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, "Mm, I'm not sure. And they said, well, check out that occupational handbook and see if you see something in there that you might be interested in. And so I did that. And as a result, we actually had to call as part of our research, someone who was doing what we wanted to do. And so at that time, I called Edwina Moore, who was one of the few Black women uh, working on camera at Channel 2, the CBS station, WBBM. And she said, well, you know, I have an English degree. I was an English teacher before they recruited me as a journalist. I suggest you join your high school newspaper staff as soon as you get there. So this was in seventh grade. Uh, I'm one of the few people that probably knew what they wanted to do at 12 and sort of continued on with that in various iterations, you know, until now. And so I would say that um, grounding and also that opportunity to actually speak to someone like that was really impactful for me. And so I went on to become uh, a journalist working in television news and now teaching television news at Northwestern University. Wow. I'm loving it. I'm just, I'm so stoked to talk to you because I, you know, you're an author, professor, a filmmaker. You, like you said, you're a journalist. So you're doing all of these things in the space. And I love it because you are a fellow woman of color. And which you said, you know, there's not many of us right in front of the camera doing things like that. So I want to delve first and you can tell me however you want to do it, but everything from your, your book, you got a podcast, your film, um, where do you want to begin? Cause they're all juicy to me. So where do you want to begin? Well, I think, um, first and foremost, uh, when I came out of working in TV news and came to Northwestern, one of the reasons I decided to go into education was because of the stage in my life. I had just had my first child. She was born in 1993. And I really wanted um, to have a little bit more flexibility in my schedule. And the thought of having your summers off uh, was really very attractive, especially when you have younger children. Uh, Later on, I ended up having two other children. So having three children put a lot of, I put a lot of focus and emphasis on them, you know, and raising them. I always said, I don't want somebody else raising my children. I want to be the one who's influencing them. And so I really spent those first, you know, their formative years really focusing on them. I like to say that uh, come summer, I would tell them I'm the camp director. So I am going to be uh, organizing all the museum trips and picnics and beach days and things like that. But because I put so much emphasis on them, it wasn't until my youngest was in fifth grade that I decided I want to do some more for me. And it's really important for me to feed my intellectual uh, growth. And so I said, well, I want to get a PhD. And so in 2009, um, I decided that I was going to go back to school after all these years. And of course, I was the oldest one in the classroom, of course. Uh, But the first two years were just fantastic because I got a chance to read, read, read and um, discuss, discuss, discuss. And so it opened my mind to not only things that maybe I had missed during that 30 year gap from the time I was last in school, but the technology had changed so dramatically. Um, So footnotes were so much easier. You didn't have to use whiteout (laughs) and you, all you had to do was, you know, make an adjustment in the, in the software like EndNotes or Zotero and things like that. And I was like, wow, this is great. Now you can really focus on the content instead of just focusing on the formatting of of the paper. So that was very um, gratifying for me to be able to do that. And so I went in knowing that I really wanted to focus on Black women and Black women behind the scenes. Having been a Black woman in front of the camera, I knew that the real control was with the women behind the scenes. But I also knew that there weren't a lot of them out there. And so having attended the National Association of Black Journalists for many, many years, I began the research by tapping into some of those women who I had met along the way. But also the other thing I had noticed is that I ran a program at the time called Teaching Television, which was really an internship program here. And I was starting to see more white women become news directors. That's the top editorial job in newsrooms. But I wasn't seeing women of color, particularly black women, take on those top roles. And so 
between just experiencing not engaging with some of those women there, but then also seeing some of those women at the conventions that I would go to, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to really focus on this group? Because no one had ever talked to them before. And so I ended up doing a study of 40 Black women television news managers as part of the dissertation, and then to turn that into a book with obviously some additional research and some additional interviews. So it it was really fascinating, I would say. Um, The book came out right around the time that two very prominent women took the top roles at Network News. So that's Kimberly Godwin at ABC News is the president there, the top ranking editorial person at the Network News. That is huge. And then Rashida Jones, who was at MSNBC in a similar role. And so um, I think we're at a time where, you know, we talk a lot about the impact that journalism can have. And so what my book does is really says, yes, uh, journalism has an impact, but let's take a look at when Black women are running the show. What do they do Mm -hmm. differently? Um, And then what does the industry do to them? Because as you can imagine, it it was not a bed of roses for them. Um, I looked at women who started their management careers probably in the late 70s, early 80s, all the way up to now. And you can imagine some of the earlier women really faced serious, not microaggressions, but Mm -hmm. macro aggressions Mm -hmm. and macro assaults, you know, very specific language like, um, you know, I don't want to take orders from a black woman directly to them, cursing them out when they would tell them to do something Mm -hmm. because they were not used to having a black woman lead them. And they thought that she couldn't be competent enough to lead them uh, in the right direction. And so that was not surprising, but some of the stories that they tell are quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I really wanted to look at is what difference does it make? You know, we hear all this uh, talk about diversity and why it's important to have diversity and inclusion. Well, I wanted to look at some some specific ways that Black women make a difference. And so one example would be, you know, the recent young, white, attractive woman who was found out West. um, And there's a lot of coverage that's been going on Mm -hmm. over the last weekend about um, this young woman. Mm -hmm. And so... uh, And it's called, there's a name for it, missing white woman syndrome is actually what it's called. And what we see is that network news in particular, um, when they, when there's a young, attractive white woman who goes missing, I mean, they get all over that story, but they don't do the same thing when a woman of color is missing. And the reason why this matters is because you can find the person if, if the nation is looking for this person you're more likely to be able to figure out where she last was, to find her hopefully alive. In this case, you know, this this young woman was not found alive. But I think that coverage makes a huge difference. And when you have Black women in control, they're aware of this disparity. They're aware that Black women need to be covered with the same dignity and respect that other women are covered. And they are more likely to take those stories of Black women and other women of color and highlight them and lift them up. So that's just one example of what I found um, with the study of how Black women make a difference when they are in leadership roles in newsrooms. Mm. You know, I I love that. And it's so ironic you mentioned this story because I really hadn't followed because I've I've stopped watching the news because I found that it it gets my blood pressure going. Mm, um, I understand. So I stopped, I stopped watching it, but for many years I was a news junkie because I was a Intel officer in the Navy and just everything. But it's funny you mentioned this story because I hadn't followed it. And I was speaking to someone today and they were talking about this story. And I was like, what are you talking about? So they filled me in on this story and they mentioned the, the, the white, missing white woman syndrome, right? They didn't call it by that, but basically that's Mm -hmm. what it was. And I was talking to this person I was talking to was a white female and they were like, yeah, you know, you know, we don't understand why people are so upset. And I started thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, it is true what people are saying because yeah, when a black woman goes missing, you don't get that coverage. Right. Um, So it's very interesting that you're saying that, that the fact that having women of color making those decisions behind the camera 
brings these things to the forefront because I don't think people understand that because you have the white men and the white women who are behind and in front of the camera. So they're reporting what they want to report, right? Just like they were saying, well, um, this criminal, you know, when they put their picture up, it's the nice picture with them in the suit and, you know, with the family, but this person was a scumbag. And of course they're talking about somebody of color. Right. And I said, well, that's because of the people giving the news. Right. And that's, you know, they don't know like, well, yeah, they should portray them. Like they want to portray them. They're trying to make this person seem like they're so great. And it's just, it's funny the disparities that you see. So I'm so glad you're bringing this to the forefront because I don't think, People understand that and realize that, especially if you're not in the industry. You know, absolutely. And and so this recent case with Gabby Petito, for example, uh, we know that there are going to be people behind the scenes making a decision on not only will she get coverage, but how much coverage will she get and the type of coverage she will get. So I was uh, driving back from a family gathering this weekend and I was listening to CNN on uh, the radio. And I mean, it was wall to wall coverage for her. And I'm not saying I'm sure from her family's perspective, they want that because they want some answers. And I get that. I understand that. But other families whose daughters, sisters, wives of color go missing, they want the same thing. And that's not what they get. And so Gabby Petito becomes a household name. Right. But people like Diamond and Tianda Bradley, who were two mm-hmm. black girls in the Chicago area who went missing more than a decade ago, they still have not been found. But if you say their names, nobody is going to know who they are because they haven't gotten the same kind of coverage that other women have, white women in particular, and white attractive women, I, I should add, because we need to be as specific as possible when we think about some of these names. And I would say, you're right. The average person thinks, well, because I see so-and-so on camera, things must be all good. Mm -hmm. But what they don't know is that on-camera personality, they might see their billboard on, you know, the side of the bus or, you know, one of these big billboards on the highway, but they have very little control. Somebody else, a manager is telling them, this is when you're going to work. This is when you're going to take a vacation. This is how you're going to cover that story. And so I think it's really important for people to understand the role that the behind the scenes manager plays in creating the narrative that we get. And I think if the audience understood that a little bit more, they would understand why they get what they get Mm -hmm. in terms of coverage. And so to your point about not watching um, news, being a fellow Chicagoan, you know that when we wake up on Monday morning in Chicago, we get the latest shooting count. Mm -hmm. And that's all we get. And so people get tired of that. They get tired. They want to know what are are some solutions. It's not that we shouldn't cover that. Because gun violence is a real issue in Chicago, mm-hmm. but we should cover it in a way that helps people understand the root causes of this gun violence and really begin to pull back these layers and ask ourselves, how did we get here? This, this is that they've been reporting these kinds of things for decades. And so the question is, what is going to cause a pivot, a shift, a change And so there's something called solutions journalism that more and more journalists are starting to consider. And so solutions journalism really looks at um, where are there places where they are solving very difficult problems to solve? And what are they doing if we can replicate what they're doing in other places, in other cities, in other governments, in other towns, then maybe we can actually improve the situation. And I think that's a draw for audience members like yourself who are really just fed up with all the negative news. I mean, you know, I even have to take a diet, right? I have to take a break (laughs) from from particularly television news. I found that during the pandemic, you know, it it was just, okay, you wake up watching news, you go to bed. I had to Uh stop watching it at nighttime. Mm-hmm. because um, that those are the thoughts in my head as I'm going to sleep. And those aren't necessarily the thoughts. And I don't, I don't want to forget the impact that these kinds of stories have on families because they have a huge impact, not just on the person who shot, but the whole community is impacted by that. And so 
for a self-preservation stamp from a self-preservation standpoint, sometimes I have to back up as well. But my goal is always, you know, with the book, Ladies Leading, the Black Women Who Control Television News, is to give some insight to readers about what this industry is really like and have them be more educated so that they can begin to take more ownership of what they watch. You know, it's easy now to send an email to the news director or the executive producer and say, you know, I saw that piece and I didn't understand why you did this. I really liked how you did this. You know, give them some positive feedback too, but give them some feedback and let them know what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. And that's so important because I, I don't think, well, I, I know that us as consumers of television, I don't think we know that we can email the editor and say, or, you know, that news manager and say, hey, yeah, I saw this it was good, or this is what you shouldn't say, or maybe I would like to know these things instead of you just reporting this. Because I think we all are in this, of this mindset is, okay, this is the news and this is what we get and we have no input or say on what's going on. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times when I was working as an on-camera reporter, my last station was in Tampa, Florida at WFLA TV, and I would be out on a story and someone would come up to me and say, oh, I think you're really doing a great job. I was like, good. Call my boss, email them and let them know that. Um, Or they might say, you know, I really didn't like that story that you all did the other day. And I would say, good. Make sure you let somebody in in management to know that because they are the ones making Mm -hmm. those kinds of decisions and they have the power to change it. And so I want also people to be empowered to say, you know, without an audience, television news, online news, audio news, who are we going to broadcast to without an audience? And so the audience really, really has more power than I think they know and then they give themselves credit for. Wow. And that's something I think all the listeners should really take away from this is you have the power. You are the consumers. You're watching this and you have the power to actually change the narrative and let them know what you like to see and what you don't want to see because we're being fed what someone else is dictating to us. Absolutely. Wow. So before we leave the book, when you're when you're interviewing these women, um, what other things did you find out were some of the obstacles that they've gone through in their careers that people don't know about? So I think some of the biggest obstacles are the microaggressions that they experienced in the newsroom, especially you know, having to prove themselves, Mm -hmm. feeling as though, you know, the imposter syndrome, but also feeling as though others thought they were incompetent. So they're having to calculate all of this in their thinking before they even do the job. I mean, this is a tough job, what they have, regardless of your gender or your racial or ethnic Mm -hmm. identity. Being in news management is tough. But on top of that, when you have to factor in multiple identities, you are always having to sort of factor that in, in your conversations with employees. And so that's extra labor. And I think we don't often think about it as such. I remember one woman said, you know, one of the things that I fight is having to be perceived as the angry black woman. And so as a result of that, when I have a conversation with an employee, I may have to temper how I say it. I may have to use a different tone so they don't think that I'm angry, even though I might be angry about something that they actually shouldn't have done and that they wouldn't have done with other bosses and other uh, superiors. And so that fighting that stereotype of the angry black woman was a big, well, that was a biggie for a lot of the women. Um, And I would say on the flip though, one of the other things that really, stood out in terms of a pattern is how important mentoring was to these Mm. women. They felt it was so important that they not be the only ones, that they not be the last ones. And so they wanted to make sure they mentored all people, but they took a special interest in mentoring other black women and other people of color because they knew that it's, you know, if we're not, if we don't keep our eye on the ball, Mm. you know, whatever progress we make, it's easy to backslide. 
And so these women knew that. And so they took mentoring really, really seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, those two things, you know, so on the one hand, again, they're doing extra work to have to think about extra labor, how they want to approach it. And then they're doing extra work because they want to do extra mentoring of people. And so it's extra, you know, and they don't get paid for that extra work that they do. And so, you know, what I argue in the book is that it may be that the industry itself is getting even more value out of Black women than they are of other people. But are they acknowledging that? Because burnout is also, oh yeah, you know, uh, real uh, for many of the women. So some of them had left the industry, you know, to take a little bit of a break and then come back to the industry. So it, it was one of those situations where for me, it was really, really gratifying to hear what these women had to say. You know, I could be nosy from a research standpoint Mm -hmm. and really get a sense of what their lives were like. You know, they talked about family. You know, that's something that is also very important. Uh, One woman said, you know, I've moved 12 different times for this career. And that means each time you move, if you have children, you've got to put them in different schools. You've got to get different child care. You've got, uh, if you have a spouse that you're working with, that spouse has to find new employment. So there were a lot of sacrifices that women made. Uh, some of them had bi-coastal, you know, relationships mm-hmm. where they were on one coast and their spouse and uh, children were on another coast and they would, you know, fly in ever so often to uh, be with the family. And so, you know, that, that takes a toll. Um, but some of the women, you know, they really love what they do as well. And so they're willing to make those those sacrifices. So those are some of the additional um, points that I think the book brings out and that I think it's important for people to consider when they think about the different sacrifices that these women mm-hmm. have made. Wow. And it, and I'm so intrigued by this book because um, that's one of my passions I've been speaking on. And I'm actually doing a talk in a couple of weeks about Black women in tech, well, women of color in tech and how they're qualified, but they're often overlooked because of some of the same things that you mentioned as far as the women of color in news. And it's it's so funny because I'm listening to you talk and I'm going, yep, yep, know that, know that, you know, knowing the, you know, angry black woman, you know, being, you know, perceived that way. And that's how they automatically view you because I've had to go through that as well. And yeah, you're, you're telling yourself, okay, yeah, I really can't act the way I want to act because that's going to give them exactly what they're saying. So let me have a half smile on and kind of say it this way so that I'm not, you know, labeled as the angry black woman. So yes. So absolutely. And and I think what you just, just described, we see not just in news, but in all professions. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons with my podcast, um, this recent season, I pivoted to uh, women in a variety of fields, you know, in law, uh, entrepreneurs, um, tech, because we know that some of these patterns exist in all fields. And they also exist for white women sometimes as well, because of their gender. They also sometimes can be perceived as, you know, the B word if they mm-hmm. are too aggressive or, or somebody feels that they're too aggressive or they can be uh, also perceived as incompetent just because they're a woman. And so I think there is some overlap there. But again, because of the multiple identities that black women embody, we're getting it from both sides, you know, from, from a racial racism and sexism is one of those mm-hmm. things you have to deal with. And, and then the other thing I would say, too, was interesting. There's even racism and sexism in the numbers. And so uh, one of the reasons there's not, you know, there's not a place where you can go and say, well, how many black women ma- journalism managers are there in the country? Well, nobody keeps those statistics. Right. They either are categorized by race or gender, but not the intersection of the two. And what we really need to be doing is if we can do all this other big data, Mm -hmm. then why can't we break down these numbers so that we have a sense of who's experiencing what and how their identities actually impact what they're experiencing? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one thing that I found uh, very troubling uh, because it, it just stood out to me that, wow, we're not even counting Black women or Latino women or Asian women or Native American women. Um, And so those are things that younger people, I hope, 
will pick up that mantle and say, okay, we're going to change this and we're going to change it now. Mm. Love it. Yeah, we can go on forever. We'll we'll have to connect later. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to your film. So it is Mandela in Chicago. Tell us about that and why you did this film. So in uh, about the time that I finished the dissertation, I became a fellow, a part of our Cartemquin Film Company does a Diverse Voices and Documentary Fellow. And their goal was really to get more people of color, again, making films. We know that we are in films and we are portrayed in films, but how often are we having the control to actually form the narrative? And so, as you can tell, that's that's all, that's what I'm all about, right? You can see it in the title and <laughs> in this particular endeavor, control. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but being able to have some say and some say so in controlling the narrative and who's going to be in the documentary. So uh, around that time, um, being part of this fellows program, you know, we had to come up with an idea. And one of the things that I thought about is I had been doing what we call the South Africa journalism residency program. I had just started that. And so I was traveling to South Africa to Johannesburg quite a bit. And one of my predecessors would actually bring in Chicagoans into the classroom to talk about Chicago's role. And as I listened to them, I started thinking, wow, there are a lot of Chicagoans who really had a role in the anti-apartheid movement, but most people don't know about it. And so when we think about the anti-apartheid movement, we think about probably Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles. We think, we think about these cults, but we don't think about the Midwest. And I began to think back as a Chicagoan, you will uh, remember this probably, is that Trinity, United Church of Christ on the mm-hmm. South Side, who's um, Pastor Emeritus is Jeremiah Wright mm-hmm. of Obama fame. His church in the in the 80s, late 70s and 80s, put up a sign that said free South Africa. And I remember seeing that sign when I was in high school, but not being quite sure what, what was that sign about. Um, again, it gave me an opportunity to be nosy, right? So I could go back and interview him. So it was a real full circle moment for me to interview Jeremiah Wright to talk about this sign. And so in the documentary, he says, uh, you know, we had a social justice ministry before social justice was even a thing. Right. And so we are focused on where there are injustices across the globe. We need to know about those injustices. So he put up that sign. And what's interesting, the story he tells is that he actually reached out to other black churches in Chicago. They would not agree to put the sign up. And so he tells that story in the documentary, sort of behind the scenes of that. And so I I wanted to focus on that because I started learning about so many Chicago Mm -hmm. activists who had been involved in this movement. And because I didn't live in the city during that time period where they were most active, I don't think I knew in any great depth what was really happening. And at one time, they would have thousands of people on Michigan Avenue protesting in front of the South African consulate. And so if you weren't around at that time, you probably wouldn't know it. There were numerous organizations and there was a multiracial coalition. You know, we talk about Chicago being such a segregated city and it still is. Mm -hmm. But this was a time period where organizations um, came together to focus on this thing called apartheid. And so in 1993, after Nelson Mandela was released from prison after 27 years, he came to Chicago to thank the people of the city. And uh, what really was gratifying for me in putting this documentary together is to talk to uh, Lindy Way Mabusa in her South African home. She had been in charge of organizing Nelson Mandela's visit. She was the South African component to organize his visit to Chicago in 1993. And You know, she's in her 80s and many of the people in the documentary were in their 70s and 80s when I did the interviews. And so what I knew was that there was some urgency. I wanted them to be able to tell their stories, not have somebody else tell their stories, you know, and put a different spin on it. But I wanted them to be able to tell their stories while they still could. And so I interviewed, I think it was 28 people total for the documentary. And already four of those people have passed away just in the short time that the documentary, um, that I started the documentary, which was 2016. And then the documentary aired on the PBS station here in Chicago in February 
of this year, February of, tw- of 2021. And so um, my, my goal was really, again, to highlight, to uplift the work, you know, some 30 years later, to teach a new generation about the work. Uh, and I always kind of like to say that I think the anti-apartheid movement in Chicago um, was kind of sandwiched in between the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and how it's different is that uh, you know, you have a different generation who's who's actually out there on the streets protesting. There was no social media right. for them to be able to pull people together. And so there was also a real education, a real consciousness raising that these organizations had to do because the average person in Chicago was saying, well, what does that have to do with me? Um, that's 8,000 miles away. What is what's going on in South Africa have to do with what's going on here in Chicago? But once they learned and they heard, they realized it has everything to do mm-hmm. with the still racial segregation, economic inequality that we're facing right here in the Chicago area. Mm-hmm. And so I think that um, those are some of the elements that stood out for me. And, and then also I wanted to teach my students. So last year I taught a class using some of the footage from the documentary. And I'm actually tomorrow will be teaching that class again so that a new generation will know what happened then, but they will be able to take that information and figure out how do they want to make the world better, not just today, but tomorrow. Mm, I love that. And I'm actually, I can still view that on PBS. Yes. So if you just go to Mandela in Chicago, uh, Google WTTW, Mm -hmm. which are the station call letters, you can watch it. Okay. Because I want to see that. Um, very interesting, very interesting. And and I've been to Johannesburg. This was after, well, shortly before Mandela passed, but I would love to actually see that documentary and, and know about that movement in Chicago. Because in 1993, I was off at, you know, finishing up college. So I wasn't in the city at that time. Um, so this is going to be very interesting, very eye awakening for me. So that is something I'm very interested in. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Just like I said, I'm like, oh, I'm like, if we could just sit down and have this conversation, I need to we need to get some wine and I need to sit down. <laughs> and this need to be our virtual happy hour or something. Yes, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Just great. So you have your book, your film and your podcast. And you now give us a little bit more about your podcast. So the podcast is called Ladies Leading, and it's really an outgrowth of the book. So I started again. I always like to include students as much as possible because I think they learn a lot. So both in the documentary and the book, they helped me with transcriptions. They, you know, that's that can be the bane of your existence when you're trying to deal with uh, transcribing all of this material. So I know it became tedious for them, but in the end, they learned a lot and they got some credits at the end of the film as well as in the book. And so the podcast started with looking specifically at the chapters in the book. And I had young journalism students, women of color, weigh in on the chapters. And so part of it was a little sad because some of the microaggressions that these women had experienced, they were saying, hey, I experienced this on an internship and this is a microaggression. So, but I think the good thing in the end, I said, I hope I haven't dissuaded you from going into journalism as a result of, you know, really analyzing this book. And what's interesting is they said, no, because now we just know what to prepare for. And I think that's what we want to give our young people, right? We want them to know, yes, the sky's the limit, but here's the history. Understand how we got here. And I think that will help you understand where you're going. So that was the first of, say, five episodes of the podcast. But just recently, I pivoted to uh, add women of other fields as well. In particular, I want to focus on Black women because, again, that intersection of those two identities is quite fascinating. And I know that when, you know, that rising tide lifts all boats. And so mm-hmm. when we highlight and uplift Black women, we are uplifting the world in, in my mind. And so uh, recently I had I, the first episode last week with Lauren Wampa, who's a, a fintech person. She is a the social, me- she is the, the social media person for Dave, which is a digital banking service um, out in California. And so I'm looking at um, young women as well who are doing things that no one has had a chance to do before and who might not necessarily 
be out there and be uh, looked at by legacy media. And so I think it's so important, again, to let people know that these people are there and what they are doing is so important to moving us forward because we hear so much negative news, right? Yeah. And that's we need, the we need something positive. Exactly. And, and that's how I feel. You know, let's hear the positive side because the negative is like you can throw that out all day long, but let's hear the positive, the stories that go untold, you know, the things that only certain people know about, because when you hear it, when the masses hear about it, it's like, oh, really? Oh, didn't know that. Right. And and we need that balance, right? Right. We need that balance is that it can't all be negative and it can't all be positive because that's not how life is. You know, it's about positives and negatives. And um, knowing that I think helps us get through um, some of the negatives to know that it's not all negative. And sometimes it's easy to feel that way. Yes. Yes. This episode is being sponsored by True Vision. Have you lost hope in starting your business, lost steam, or just do not know where to go from here? See with True Vision and define your path. The True Vision Project seeks to heal, rebuild, and transform your online business from the inside out. For more information and early access for only Trina Talk listeners into the True Vision Project, send an email to connect at definingpaths.info. Make sure to mention that you heard about it on Trina Talk. Well, Ava, we're going to go into our questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. I hope I am. (laughs) You're ready. Okay. Who or what motivates you? Hmm. I think my children motivate me because I always want to set a good example for them. And I think you can talk all day long. But what they're doing is not so much listening, they're watching. And I think showing them that you can be a lifelong learner, that you never stop learning is very important. Mm -hmm. What demotivates you? Negativity. You know, I'm generally a very positive person. And I think that uh, sometimes people think I'm too positive. You know, I look on the bright side and maybe I don't have enough empathy. But um, negativity just feels like I, I'm not into the Debbie Downers. Yeah. Let's focus on the positive and focus on the future. Oh, yeah. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked out for your good? Well, you know, when I was writing the book, I was able to, there were some memories that came up for me, even, you know, working in the newsroom where um, I remember one time I had gotten this hard to get interview. And one of the managers said, who did you sleep with to get that? Wow. And, you know, at the moment I was so taken aback, I didn't know what to say, you know, but that negativity, I think when it came back to my memory, when I was writing the book, I thought, Man, so many of us have experienced microaggressions Mm -hmm. that maybe we repress them and don't even think about them until something comes up that reminds me of them. And as a result of that, one of the things that I do, I also have coaching business. And one of the things that I've been doing is really focusing on those microaggressions. You know, how should people respond to microaggressions Mm -hmm. when they recognize them? Should they respond at all? Because sometimes you may not want to respond, at least in that moment. Uh, And sometimes you're so shocked that you're not sure what to say. And so I think turning that moment into, well, how could I learn more about microaggressions because I included a lot of that in the book, Mm -hmm. but also now how can I take that knowledge and also help people decide how they want to handle those so that they can resolve some of those issues. Mm. What is your fear? The fear is that I will run out of time. (laughs) I mean, I think that, um, you know, there's so much to do and time is going so fast And so if I could uh, have a superpower, it would be to just bottle some time so that when I need some extra time, I could just pour some out and just get what I need. Yeah. When you do that, send me a bottle too. I know. I'd be be quite wealthy, right? If I was, if I were able to do that. 
I need more time and more sleep. That's what I need. <laughs> yeah. You can do so much with it, you know, more sleep, more shopping, more relaxation, <laughs> more self-care, more work if you want to do that. Exactly. Yes. Is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? Hmm. You know, I think there are always times, and I can't give you a specific, but what comes to mind is there's always been a time where you wish you had said something and you didn't say it right then at the moment. And then later you thought about all these things you could have said and you should have said. So I think I always have those um, those moments. I mean, I don't like to hurt people's feelings mm -hmm. for the most part. And so I think there are some things that I might have thought but didn't say. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should have said them and didn't. So I think those would be the only kinds of regrets that I might have had. Okay. So here's the opposite. Is there a time that you wish you had not done something? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of something that would be very specific. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, recently, I have a tendency to uh, really want to fix things, you know, and want to organize things. And so uh, I was planning a, a trip for a family member, and it was just supposed to be the, the two of us. And I decided that, oh, it'd be great to let some other people know so that they could come along if they're interested in coming along. Uh, again, my desire to sort of, you know, bring more people along, but it turned out that family member didn't want that. That family uh, member just really wanted it to be a very small trip and not a big trip. So that was a time where I thought, oh, I should not have, you know, invited all these other people. I should have just kept it small. Mm. What is your definition of success? So my definition of success is feeling accomplished, whatever that accomplishment is. And so, as I was saying earlier, you know, I really spent a lot of my early years at the university really focused on my children and raising them. And so I am so happy now that they've grown up, they're out of the house and, you know, you don't have any perfect kids. There's no perfect parenting. You're, you always have ups and downs, but for the most part, you know, I think that um, they become pretty solid adults. And so now that I'm able to do some of the things that I sort of put on hold, uh, that helps me feel satisfied and accomplished. And so those would be um, being able to do the work that you want to do. To me, that's what success is. How do you recharge? So... I think one of the things that I really enjoy, and I'm learning this more and more, is music. And so I love to go to live concerts. Now, obviously, we haven't been able to do that um, with COVID. But here in the Chicago area, you're probably familiar with Ravinia. Mm -hmm. And I have actually been to two Ravinia concerts this summer. Oh. And, you know, it's outdoors. And the first one was Brian McKnight. And that was great. And then the second one was Black Violin. And I don't know if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. group, but there are two uh, young African-American men who met in high school in Florida and they take classical music and marry it with hip hop and R&B. And I'm telling you, their music is fabulous. I just love oh. it. And so I think being able to listen to live music, whether it's, you know, at a major concert hall or just a local community um, just this past week, we went to hear um, uh, a group in our area called Funkadizi, and they kind of marry, um, I would say, Indian music with a little African music with, you know, it's really kind of world music. Mm -hmm. And it was just fabulous just sitting out there, you know, with your lawn chair, listening to some live music. So I think that's a great way to wind down and to de-stress. Yeah, I, I miss that about Chicago, the, the concerts and all of that. Oh, yeah. The DuSable, they've been having yes. concerts this year. I haven't been able to make any of them, but they also um, are, you know, doing that for the community. And again, it's it's great to be able to hear that. It's nothing like live music, right. you know, you can 
you can listen with your headphones and, and get stereophonic sound, but there's nothing like engaging with it right in front of you. Right. What are you awesome at? Hmm. Well, I think I'm pretty awesome at organizing, you know, keeping, again, it's a work in progress, right? But um, organizing for getting stuff done, Uh because I think you have to be organized. There's so much to do and so little time. And I think organization is one of the key. And also organizing some things off your plate is also very important because there's only so much time in the day. And one of the things I had to learn with the documentary and the book is that I had to move a lot of stuff off of my plate. Mm -hmm. And I I was really much better for it because some of those things I don't think I'll ever go back to. And so um, I think I'm pretty good at that. Mm. What legacy do you want to leave? So the legacy for me, I think, will be that of constant learning and whether that learning is formal. Again, going back for a PhD program at age 47, you know, is not what the average person does. However, um, I now have colleagues who are going back to get their PhD and they used me as an example. So if I can be an example for somebody else to continue a a life of learning, then I'm extremely happy with that. Mm. I think you just did it, but give the listeners one motivational takeaway. One motivational takeaway would be you are never too old to learn. And no matter what you think about, oh, I didn't get a chance to do that when I was in my 20s, or I didn't get a chance to do that in, in my 40s, you can still do it no matter what your age. So don't let, don't let age be a deterrent to what you want to do. Wow. Ava, tell the listeners how they can connect with you, how they can get your book, if still viewing the uh, documentary, the whole nine yards. So uh, I'm on Facebook, of course, Ava Thompson Greenwell, uh, Twitter, A-T Greenwell, Ava T. Greenwell. They can go to ladiesleading.net. That's where they can find information on the book. And for the film, they can go to www.mandelainchicago.com but they have to get more information about the film. But if they want to watch it, just Google Mandela in Chicago, WTTW, and they can watch the film there. Great. Ava, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and being with me today on Trina Talk. It's been a blast. Thank you for having me. If you like Trina Talk podcast, please don't forget to go out to iTunes and rate it five stars and leave a review. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their life? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.